first of all, I would like to welcome our uh, panelists today. And, and first, I would like to start the ladies. Uh, Hatsiri Barrios, uh, welcome. Uh, Hatsiri, as you already might have read, she is the CEO of ETU Airspace, and, and she will be sharing some insights uh, with us today. And, and then we have uh, also uh, Eduardo Solis from uh, BAP, BAP Airspace, and uh, he, he's been on both uh, sides of the, of the border, I'm going to say. Uh, he, he's been a, a, on the buyer side and now the supplier side, and, and he's also going to be sharing some insights uh, for us. And then let's welcome uh, Alejandro Pavon, who is uh, from the Safran Air Systems team, uh, who happens to be on the buyer side. And I believe that most of you uh, joining us today uh, have already uh, met uh, Alejandro in, in some of our uh, previous conversations, or perhaps uh, trying to quote something for, for Safran. So um, thank you. Uh, thanks to the three of you for uh, joining us today. And um, th this panel is going to be very interesting because uh, obviously there's a pre-COVID-19 and a, and a post-COVID-19 uh, forecast and, and, and spirit. And, and that's what we're going to be uh, sharing today. And especially because uh, I'm going to put just a brief context. We see uh, four different avenues uh, that uh, bring opportunities for Mexico. Obviously, if and only if we get ready for those opportunities. And what those opportunities are is uh, that there's uh, some uh, effects on reshoring or nearshoring uh, coming back from Asia. There's also buyers that had single sourcing in Asia and that they said that they should have had developed a dual source in Mexico, and they didn't do it before, which once again means a very good opportunity. And then most importantly, and this is something that we need to pay attention to over the next decade, uh, over 50 million uh, baby boomers are going to be retiring this decade. And what that means, it's obviously we're going to be uh, potentially losing a lot of uh, know-how. So, so over here, once again, the, those avenues bring a very good opportunity for us and what I would like to do is uh, try to follow uh, right now a sequence from the buyer all the way down to the suppliers. And my, my first question would be for Alejandro Pavon in, into what, how, how do you see the forecast for Safran Air System and the airspace industry in general, uh, whether it is commercial, defense, or business aviation? How do you see the forecast uh, in this uh, post-COVID-19 era? How, how should, should we get ready for it? Here and, and all, of, all of the audience, uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you guys today. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Javier, uh, the forecast is becoming uh, very promising. promising. Uh, we are recovering, as you know, the, the US domestic uh, industry. It's uh, really improving. The China domestic uh, market also is very improvement improving regardless of the slower improvement in other regions like like uh, america latin america some places in europe i mean the two largest uh, markets are improving so my forecast is that uh, by the end of this year uh, those two huge markets will be up to speed in next year uh, the worldwide uh, economy on the aerospace side will start to, to move again, seeing uh, uh, the transit and transportation from one continent to another. So I see that like a very, in a very optimistic mode, regardless of this new wave. Uh, I think through, from now up to the end of the year, uh, the 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 countries will improve their vaccines. I mean, improve the application. I mean, and in that terms, uh, I see that very optimistic. In particular, some some specific projects of, of Safran. Uh, we are we are in a ramp up at this point. So I hope that uh, the rest of the key programs that we have inside. Uh, uh, become uh, into a into a good uh, ramp up uh, through the end of this year and, and early next one. So it's not uh, the fact that I am optimistic. It's the fact that I am putting my eyes and my attention to the bigger markets. 
and bigger markets are improving. So I am speaking from what I am seeing, not from my personal perspective. So uh, the market is doing well, uh, same as my coffee from Veracruz. I am enjoying my fantastic coffee from Veracruz, and I hope that we, we will enjoy the market uh, and the growing through the end of this year and starting early next year, Javier. Thanks a lot, Alejandro. And, and obviously, we see a forecast on different OEMs expecting a recovery, let's say from 15, 30%. And, and that's just what you are just referring to right now. Uh, Hat City, uh, on the supply chain side, have you seen any impact? What, what expectations do you have? Yeah, um, I, I could say that um, for the SMEs, that, that the next challenge or our, our challenge right now is to be ready to be prepared for what it comes. Definitely uh, on our perspective as ETU, we have received a lot of RFQs in the past months. We have seen how the ramp up and the reactivation of programs that were standby have come back again. And, uh, and definitely customers are looking for readiness, are looking for capabilities and are looking for um, for, for ways to expand. Uh, it's uh, definitely that the reshoring or nearshoring is happening. And, uh, and my best um, advice to all the SMEs is to be ready uh, and um, yeah, to expect a good, a good recovery and a huge opportunity in uh, capturing new businesses in the aerospace industry. That, that, that's really good. I, I was just saying that uh, we were expecting between 30, I mean, 15, 30% as a recovery, especially in the commercial area, which, which is uh, very, very uh, connected to what you're saying. We, we have to be ready. Uh, Eduardo, this question goes for you as to what, what uh, forecast do you see from the uh, for full integration? I mean, you know, on the BAP airspace side, uh, you, you were the finishing, so you might be seeing a lot of uh, potential growth right now, especially uh, in regards of uh, quotations and potential market share uh, growing up. What, what, what's your uh, share in this and what, what insights can you provide us? Well, well definitely we see a, a, a coming back of all the OEMs through ones through twos coming with packages to Mexico. Uh, what well, is interesting from our perspective, um, just, just for a picture, uh, if we look at the pyramid of the supply chain, we are in the base of the, of the supply chain, right? So we are a company that provides uh, Trading services to different companies throughout Mexico, and with, with that, we we had the opportunity to support companies in, in Querétaro, in Monterrey, obviously in Tijuana, where we are based in, in Hermosillo, and we see this uh, wave of, of of packages coming back to Mexico. What is interesting also is that those packages are moving towards more complex parts, which is nice because that's where. I believe uh, as, an, as, as a country in Mexico, we are in that area where to be competitive, we need to go into a higher complexity, but also that uh, brings uh, challenges and opportunities in terms of integration in Mexico. Obviously, for the, for the, from the perspective of the OEMs through ones through twos, they need to get finished parts from Mexico for them to be you know, um, uh, attractive. So with that, that incorporates a need for the special processes, you know, all the, you know, chemical processing, coatings, as well as the heat treatments and the weldings and the shot peelings and et cetera. So it, it is in that readiness as, as Hatsi was mentioning, as, as we are ready to embrace these packages, I think it's a, it's a common and joint effort from the top of the pyramid with the OEMs and tier one, tier twos, the middle of the pyramid with the ETUs, and the base of the pyramid with the BAPS uh, to work together and integrate as a, a solution. But definitely, I mean, it's just every every day, I mean, every week we are we are quoting hundreds of part numbers from, from different customers. This uh, integration uh, item that you're mentioning, I believe that's gonna be very important. And, and this goes towards my next question. And first question, uh, it's going to be addressed again to Alejandro Pavon into if there's this big opportunity coming back to Mexico, this is like a second wave opportunity for us. 
what have we in Mexico not done right uh, or, or what can we do right in order to gain more business? If we, if we were to try to talk to uh, like uh, what Eduardo and Hatsidi were saying, we have to be ready. What does ready? What what does being ready mean uh, for for companies like Safran? And and what what recommendations do you give us, Alejandro? Yes, uh, what I have seen, and I think it's not uh, only from my side, but from other colleagues like GE, like Honeywell, even on the auto industry business, uh, the mindset of the suppliers probably is the major, the major problem because in Mexico, I have to 80% of the supplier base. And I can tell you there are many very capable. Of course, there are many that has a lot of uh, room for improvement, but overall uh, the supplier base is good enough to, to obtain new business. But the mindset is the problem. I mean, uh, when I send an RFQ to the market and I state that uh, the lead time is one week, it's one week only, you know? Not three weeks, not four weeks, not one month, not uh, one week and one day, it's, it's one week. So if we don't have discipline to quote on time and if we don't have the knowledge to quote competitive, because that is the other point that uh, when I receive uh, quotations from local suppliers giving me 200, 300% above the Europeans or the US suppliers, that's a problem. Uh, supplier has to be trained, coached, educated into cost structures. Cost structures are key and are fundamental to be competitive. Let's say, for instance, uh, when uh, you have a big piece of a uh, Inconel that I am asking you to quote, and, and everyone knows the Inconel, it's a very hard material. Uh, even it's hard, uh, well, of, of course, uh, the, the first point in there is that you need to have the knowledge how to machine Inconel. But if you start from your uh, uh, standard time, your labor, uh, your machining cost, uh, your packaging. When you analyze all of that details and you start to add um, those, those famous uh, extra monies that we say in Spanish, por si las dudas or por si las moscas, you know what I mean? And then uh, you are out of the, out of the market. You know, because my suppliers from, from China, from Taiwan, from Singapore, they will quote me in one week and they will not add any penny, additional penny uh, to my RFQ. So if you don't have your best employees doing quotations, certainly doesn't matter that you have great facilities, great operations, because you will not get any business. So my, my message, my, my suggestion to the good and capable suppliers that we have in Mexico is that you guys put into in front of the desk of the sales, those guys with most, of, most experience, uh, people very well trained on cost structures so that they are like, you know, Speedy Gonzalez, returning quotations really, really fast, but not only really fast, but really competitive. That is, that is uh, my, my message, because if you are not competitive, if you are not on time, then you are really out. It doesn't mean anything, as I said, I have seen beautiful uh, facilities in Monterrey, in Tijuana, in Chihuahua, in Querétaro, but they are very late in quotations and very expensive. And, and you know what is worse, Javier? Which when I tour those facilities, I smell quality, I smell capability, and I smell that they, they can meet the target. The point is that sometimes they don't know how to quote. They don't even know they, they are cost structures. So for me, it's very key, the mindset, and the training in cost structures. If they, if they improve that, I can tell you, 
they will gain dozens of new businesses. Those are uh, very interesting recommendations, especially because obviously the opportunity is trying to come back. But, but then again, uh, just as Alejandro was saying, we have different buyers and that they've been expressing that they, they want to help us, but we need to be uh, competitive, especially against uh, Southeast Asia or uh, countries like, like, like Turkey. Um, Hatsidia, I'm going to get back to you as to saying you've been gaining some business and obviously you, you have picked the eye of different buyers. What recommendations can you uh, give the SMEs of Mexico? How should they get ready? so that they uh, get a check mark from Alejandro and the Alejandros of the game. How, how should we follow your example? Uh, well, I, I have to say that um, based on, on, Alex, on Alejandro's uh, suggestions or, or, or recommendations, there is definitely something that we need to change in, in the leadership of, of the SMEs. And it's the mindset. Uh, it, it's definitely... Um, we need to open our criteria. We need to understand that aerospace needs to, to require or demands to fulfill some basics on quality and documentation, traceability. And we need to understand those needs. We need to understand those requirements as, as leaders of the companies and put that through a plan and, and, in, and, and, and put it in place, make it happen. Uh, it's it's important to understand that it's not only um, it's not only the capabilities of doing a, a, a good piece in 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 a first release, but it's also the capability of um, of demonstrating the capability of repeating that first piece well done through time. Aerospace is an industry that goes through time. It's not one year, three years. It's ten years, even twenty years if you are lucky. So you need to understand that lots of people are going to be doing the same part through time. And you need to guarantee your customers that that piece or that part is going to be well done through time, through all the hands that could be involved. And that needs leadership and that needs uh, open-minded in implementation of new tools, not only technologies, but we can call it soft skills. That I do believe is what, what I can suggest to SMEs on, 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 on Alejandro's suggestions. And the second one is the cost, uh, the cost basis. Definitely uh, aerospace, I could say it's an expensive business. Yes, we cannot deny that. <laughs> but, uh, but you need to understand how these business, how these costs are, are involved, how they, they are, um, how can they can be managed or administrated? Because if you receive one package and in one package, you can include the cost of non-recurring, of liabilities, of uh, um, in-source inspection, of AS9100 um, approvals, then you are definitely going out of the cost. You need to understand that you need to divide um, uh, or segregate the costs that are directly involved in the product and the costs that are, um, that are part of the aerospace business that you need to be amortizing through time or through different accounts that you are building uh, as you are growing in, into, or into the aerospace industry. But it is very important to understand those matters because it had happened that you believe that Source inspection, AS9100, and liabilities, and if we we can keep on going, are going just through one package, through one part number. And if you understand that one package, one part number, it's 50 part numbers of maybe a couple of uh, dozens of <laughs> production per year, well, you're out of business. So yeah, you need to understand how the business. Uh, it's it's um, it's breakdown through the different costs that involves being in the other specific industry. Javier, excuse me, may I say something? Go ahead. Yeah, remember that this is a French company, so I need to to <laughs> speak a, a French nyol or something like that. Uh, well, uh, something very key for the suppliers is materials. 
I just want to remember that Safran invests about 7.5% in research and design. And this is one of the companies that spends really big money on, on that. And that is a key element that has put Safran in a very top uh, position on the market, uh, beaming for research and design. So what I suggest to suppliers, probably not spending, in, this is 7.5, 7 as I mentioned, of the gross income. And that is probably too much for, for the suppliers. But what I suggest is that suppliers invest probably not in, in R&D, but invest in knowing your customers specifically on the materials. Uh, on every commodity a supplier is expert on, like for instance, Hat City is a fantastic supplier on the machine inside. She has to invest time and money in knowing all the machining materials uh, involved on the aerospace. Like for instance, Inconel, Titanium, Arcap, et cetera, et cetera. All those type of alloys that are used in this industry, she has to investigate not only the alloy, but the, the cost, the cost, the sources, where to buy what, where to buy the Arcap, where to buy the Inconel, the Titanium, which are the most competitive sources. Because if she starts to, to quote uh, an alloy, when I am sending the RQ, probably she may fail because that will be the first time she's trying to quote. So investigate your materials, your costs, your sources, your process is a very good practice, a very good chance that you can be more successful. And I mentioned Hatsiri because I know her and she is really a super lady. She, she, she does great at his company, but this is one example. But in other areas like the composites, composites is very key. As you know, a, a plane, 50% of a plane is manufactured with composites. So those suppliers who wants to manufacture composites or any product associated with composites, you guys have to investigate sources. You guys have to investigate cost, process, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that is the best homework you can ever do to help your business. Thank you, Javier. Thank you, Alejandro. Those, those are uh, great recommendations. Uh, right now, you just we, we, we just uh, passed the Olympics in uh, Japan. And it's very interesting because nobody could have had uh, participated if they were not prepared for that particular discipline. And, and that's exactly what, what you're saying right now. We need to understand um, the technical side of the business and also the rules of engagement so that we are ready, like, like what, what Hatsiri was saying. You need to understand what they're going to ask you about uh, product liability insurance, uh, like the financing side of the equation, like... Uh, uh, trying to meet deadlines, uh, KPIs, and so on. So, so it's part of understanding the game. And, and then I'm going to address the question to, to Eduardo. And, and as I said at the beginning, Eduardo comes like, like from both uh, sides of the border. He's been a buyer and he's been with leading companies. And, and, and right now he's at the other extreme. Well, where, where if you don't actually put the adequate special processes in place and certified and approved, uh, we, we, all the metal uh, component fabricators are not going to be able to, to make it. So, so uh, b based on those two positions that you've had, Eduardo, what recommendations can you give the SMEs of Mexico? How can we uh, try to uh, get advantage or take advantage of actually all the opportunities that are, that are coming over to our country? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Well, um, as you alluded, uh, I, I call myself that I have the opportunity to be in three sides of the table. As you mentioned, I've been in the, in the buyer side, you know, as a sourcing manager. I'm in the uh, supplier side as a, a special processes, but I mean also in the side of the table as a consultant for companies that are looking to, to get into the aerospace or medical device or energy industries. So uh, with that, I, I, I really enjoy what both Alejandro and Hatsiri are saying because it is, it is a simple concept to be ready. 
right? Be ready is I can I can play the game. But in order to play the game, you have to know your, your strengths. You have to have your team, right? So I think I think a, a, a strong recommendation for, for companies that want to get into the aerospace or grow into the aerospace is you have to have your team. You know, the concept of I have a supplier, I may have a supplier is not enough. You have to have your partners for the special processes, for the chemical processing, for the heat treatment, et cetera, for the raw materials, as, as you know, Alejandro was saying. It is, not, it is not good for you to go into a fight or a, a game for a quotation when you don't know your, your, your team players, right? So uh, it is important for companies that want to get into the aerospace is to understand the key players, get in touch with them, understand their capabilities, but also make sure that you have a synchronization in terms of mindset of business. Uh, I can give you an example of, uh, you know, with again, with uh, ETU. Uh, when, when we started doing uh, business with ETU, it was a lot of technical conversation with, her, with Hatir's team, uh, understanding, okay, these are the effects of the chemical processing in your machining. So we can, we have to fine tune your machining strategy so at the end, when the end result comes to the, 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 their customer, we have a, a, a part that is sustainable over and over the time, you know, for production ready, for, for, from the production perspective. But if Hatsiri's team is not open to have that dialogue with the supplier, because now, now, now we are becoming partners, uh, many companies are not open to that. And it's incredible. Because if you, as a machining supplier or as a machine supplier, you are just throwing the quotations throughout the world for the, you know, the chemical processing guys to do the quotation and the heat trees to do their quotation without knowing you, what's your strategy, what is your market, what targets do you have? Uh, it's just going to be a waste of time. So I, I really encourage companies to have their teams and, and approach, you know, the special process suppliers and understand the capabilities and what can be done and what cannot be done. Because also that will help you. Uh, I, I guarantee you that to the Alejandro's of the world, if you have a supplier that tells you right up front, you know, this package, I cannot take it. Why? Because I don't have this capability in Mexico. If you know that in the first five minutes, you're, the appreciation that they will have from you is gonna be much higher because they understand now that you know your market, you know your team, you have a team, and you are prepared to present a, a, a proposal. Uh, also uh, alluding to what Alejandro was saying about the cost model, and this is something I have uh, shared with companies a lot. The, there is a very powerful uh, concept behind the cost modeling. One is effectiveness. So you can quote quickly, but also you can make sure that the quotation that you have is sustainable from your perspective, the perspective of your business. Um, when when you have a cost model for your internal purposes, you are quick to react. But also it is important when you know what is your cost model, because when you confront the buyers, the conversation becomes technical instead of commercial. Uh, this is something that was bringing to the, to the companies over and over, you know? A, if you show me your cost model, we can talk about, you know, this element of your cost model is about time. Your machining time is, here is high. So how do we improve your machining technique in this step? So the whole conversation commercial is just secondary. Now it's about technical. And when we, we talk about technical aspects, they can be fixed. When we talk about profits, it's more challenging. And from the, from the, from the uh, profit perspective is, I think one of the first paradigms that we have to break when we, uh, when we want to get into the aerospace industry is that not because a, a, comp a component's aerospace is, is, has a higher market value. It is not true. Uh, you know, some companies said, you know, I'm making this, this screw for, for an automotive uh, application. So the cost is one cent. If I do the same for aerospace, it's gonna be $5. Well, this is not that the game. Yes, the screw for, for the aerospace is gonna be more expensive. It's just because the raw material is more expensive the special processes and so on, but it's not because it has a higher market value. You don't have more profit to gain because it's outer space. Because to the Alejandros of the world, I mean, they are comparing cost model to cost model and basically it's run rates, it's cost per hour, it's machining technique, 
is a you know a manufacturing technique, and that's what makes the difference. So uh, first paradigm is there is no higher value just because it's outer space. Second, the the beauty of of the outer space industry and why some companies, you know, like the Parkers, the the Honeywells, the Etons, why these companies get into the outer space is just because the cycle, the business cycles are much longer. You know, when you have an industry where the cycle is about 30 years, then you can have an investment that, you know, considers that. Contrary to the high consumer, you know, high turning electronic where, you know, there can be just a few months for the business cycle. Our space is a much longer business cycle. And that's why it makes sense. And it, it makes it worth it, the headache of getting into the outer space. Uh, you know, uh, from, my, from my history and with, with Eton, you know, I, I was asked that question to companies say, why a company that, you know, the portion of the outer space business is just this little compared to the corporation. Why do we, they care about this? It's just because of the business cycle. It makes a difference and it makes a difference in periods like the pandemic <laughs> where everything goes down, but still, you know, outer space defense keeps going. Those are very good uh, recommendations. Yes, yes, Alejandro, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, Javier, same as my, my coffee. My coffee, man, if you can smell it, <laughs> uh, it comes from the mountains of Veracruz and it's magnificent. My supplier, I have been, it's, it, he has been with me for years. And I want to mention that uh, in aerospace, we don't want disposable suppliers. Mm -hmm. I have suppliers for more than 20 years. If, if I am engaged with a good suppliers like Lalo, like at City, I can tell you, Javier, that we can become old 20, 25 years, and they will still be my supplier as any other industries where they dispose suppliers after two, three years of gaining productivity, they just put them in bank group and change supplier. This is not the case. Like in my case, probably if you are a supplier that you, that you are making 20% of profit, I need to know. And if you are making 20% in profit, however, you are very competitive and you are giving me a better price than the European, you know what? I will not argue your profit. Why? Because I, I will sign an LTA with you and probably I will collect two, three, one percent every year in the following five, eight years. Because the program's long for, you know, Javier, more than 10 years. So I need productivity, but I still need a successful supplier. So I don't press too much on the profit as far as the supplier is competitive. In other industries, if they see they are, you are making two digits profit, if you are making good money, they just came back and, and, and get that, that profit from your, from your product. But this is not my case. This is not the case of Zafran. And I don't think it's the case of any of the other tier ones in the industry. I mean, in this industry, you can grow, you can have a good profit. And, and for instance, some suppliers has grown with Safran, uh, changing their, their raw materials, changing their processes, changing the engineering. But uh, what I want to say is that they have uh, uh, performed, improved and, and been better along with, with Safran. So we are making money even the, the OEMs uh, are asking for productivity to Safran in the same way we request the same from suppliers. But at the end of the day, no one is reducing their margins, you know, because we are working on R&D. So if you want to grow with a good supplier, a good company like Safran or GE or any other, and if you have in your mindset the continuous improvement, the, 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 the mindset of changing probably processes, raw materials, whatever is necessary to improve your product, you know what? You will be a supplier that will stay, I will not say forever, but for a long time. Just keep in mind those uh, lip, lip engines, 
that Safran does in joint venture with General Electric. Almost every year we, we come with a new improvement on the engine. And it doesn't exactly mean that we are reducing our margins. We are doing some improvements that certainly a customer may gain any benefit, probably on the weight of the engine, probably on the performance. The, the engine may be using less fuel, but uh, we are gaining some benefit align, along with the suppliers. So my, my, my message, my bullet point is that as, as from the point of view of the supplier, you can have a long life with guys like Safran, companies like Safran or any other, if, if, if you want to grow in this industry. I mean, you are not disposable. I, don't, I am not interested in disposable suppliers. I am interested in very committed suppliers, in suppliers that want to grow with me, that want to cover my back when I have any problem. If you get my confidence, you know what, Javier? I will keep you forever. And that's what I have uh, told Hatsiri, sometimes to Eduardo and some other suppliers. This is not a temporary, this is permanent. So in th this is the good thing of this industry. We don't want disposable suppliers. We need suppliers that want to grow along with us in this venture of the aerospace industry, Javier. Thank you, Alejandro. And uh, on the supplier side, definitely it's gonna be a uh, numbers game. All the time, this is a numbers game. Um, at the beginning, Alejandro was saying that the thing about timing and uh, usually when we try to quote in Mexico, it takes us about around uh, three to four weeks. And those are the ones who quote, because there are some others that don't even uh, answer to those uh, RFQs. Um, what, what, what are we competing against uh, in, in regards to Asia? And, and then right now comes the disruption that we had last year because of COVID-19 and, and then logistics. The cost of logistics is driving us crazy right now. So, so uh, sourcing from China has been uh, complicated. So, so he, here's a twofold question. And, and, and first question would be uh, for, for uh, Health City and, and then Eduardo from the supplier side, like what message would you like to convey to, to buyers? Like what, why should they work with uh, the, the supply base in Mexico? What, what, what is it that they can gain if they work with us? Katsiri, I don't know if you can convey that message initially to potential buyers that are listening to this conversation. Yeah, that, that question looks like which is your elevator speech. <laughs> like <laughs> make your best sell in five minutes. <laughs> or less. Uh, now there, are, there are huge, yeah, there, there are huge, um, I, I would have to say there are huge uh, advantages from um, the, the supply chain in, in, in Mexico. Um, in, in the past year, Mexico have uh, demonstrated itself that it's a reliable country, uh, which is, has uh, capability in technology and human labor force. Um, we have um, evolved from a maquila industry up to an assembly and uh, even engineering uh, design um, um, comp uh, um, design um, country. Uh, we have GE here in, in, in Querétaro, which has a huge uh, engineering center. Um, we also have uh, cost competitive advantages. In Mexico, it's uh, still um, um, labor, a workforce that it's competitive. And competitive, it's not cheap. It's very important to understand the difference between competitive and cheap. Because when you talk about competitiveness, you are talking about uh, quality, you are talking about reliability, you are talking about uh, OTDs, uh, and uh, of course, less scrap, KPIs, et cetera. And those kind of things are, are they, they have their cost, but that also makes you competitive because you are more productive, you are more efficient in their supply chain. Uh, we cannot uh, ignore the, the fact of the, the 
geopolitical location of Mexico. We are um, just the neighbors from the, as Alejandro said, the highest or biggest market in the aerospace industry, the first biggest market in the industry, aerospace industry. So that also makes us very competitive in lead times and uh, the structure of um, um, integration of the supply chain in order to deliver a finished pro product in the same time frame or timeline or time zone from the uh, from the OEMs or the or the biggest assemblies lines. So I would have to say those are our competitive advantages as a country. Very, very, very good. Eduardo, what, what can you say on your side? Well, um, from my side and uh, speaking to, to buyers, uh, I, th I think there's, there's something beautiful about Mexico, which is the ability to concentrate business. Um, from my previous experience, uh, I know that, uh, you know, from the special process perspective, uh, you may have a few special processes in some countries in Asia, but if you compare the amount of, from the chemical perspective, from bed pops, aerospace perspective, the amount of special processes in one roof with the amount of approvals uh, is significantly larger than what we, you can find in, in, in Asia. So if we have the buyers and the base of the pyramid, so if we have the Safrans and the BAPs working together to enable the business, I think that's a game, a game plan. Um, the, but, but this has to be actively driven by both, you know? From the perspective of BAP Aerospace, because the history that we have, 70 years of history in the aerospace industry in, in, in the US and eight years in Mexico, we are a driving company that is always you know, approaching the, the OEMs, the tier ones, looking at, okay, what processes are you gonna bring to Mexico? So we get ready in advance, so we can now support the, the Hatsiris of the world. Uh, again, another example with Hatsiri. Uh, we started working this package where we needed an, a, a, uh, an approval from a specific OEM for uh, um, uh, FBI for uh, uh, penetrant inspection. We go, we, but we go to the OEM and say, <laughs> hey, we need to support Hatsiri. So we need to work while they work in the development of the machining component. You and I, we have to work on the approval of us uh, for the FBI. So we are ready when, when she's ready, right? But we have to be a driving force from that perspective because just for the buyers to expect evolution without having a, comp a commitment to contribute to that evolution, I, I think is, is it may be slightly naive. So I think, I think what, what we are having, at least from the perspective of BAP Aerospace, having that little open dialogue with Alejandro, with the with the other uh, the other Alejandros, it, it really pays for Mexico. It really pays when you have a, a buyer that is willing to share what's coming, what's needed, facilitating the approvals, you know, facilitating the uh, engagement of their teams to come to Mexico to audit and so on, but also the commitment from the you know special process suppliers to continue adding more processes and approvals, which is not easy. But again, if we want to capitalize this melting pot, what Mexico is, because this is really the beauty of Mexico. I mean, we have companies from the US, from, from Asia, from Europe, coming to Mexico to establish operations and producing in Mexico, but also looking for that supply chain. I mean, this is an incredible melting pot, but we have to, we have to facilitate that, that melting point to, to flourish by working together at all different levels. And we do it every day. I mean, it's, uh, it, it is it is really nice when uh, when uh, and uh, uh, Javier you and I been in other forums where the same conversation with other OEMs where we have this dialogue and we, we talk about you know what processes have to come, what investment need to come to Mexico, so we enable the hat series of the world of Mexico to you know quickly com convey opportunities into you know actual business. I think you have a great point with this, especially with the integration side, like all the metal, when we talk metal, it's uh, sheet metal fabricators and CNC machining. Uh, the, the lo lots of you, they're, they're gonna ask you for secondary processing, whether it is uh, chemical treatment or heat treatment, even welding. And, and you cannot wait for the Alejandros of the game to give you an RFQ 
with that spec to be ready. We have to be ready before that conversation. That's what companies in Turkey or in Morocco or in Southeast Asia, they're, they're ready to answer very fast. That, that's why they quote in less than 72 hours. So, so how can we do it? We, we need to first, if we, if someone in the audience is a metal fabricator, you cannot know who has secondary processing in the country, what certifications they have, what uh, dimensions they have, what, what approvals they have. And, and then if we're gonna get uh, together with uh, Alejandro and the Alejandros of the game, let's see what programs they're working for. If it's gonna be for Airbus or Boeing or Gulfstream or who is it, so that we get the, the adequate approvals and the right numbers in place. So th this uh, part of teamwork is gonna be very, very important. Uh, Alejandro, uh, this is uh, my semi last question. Hopefully we, we have enough time. Uh, and ju just as we had uh, the, the, the like, like the pitch from from the supplier side, what what are the recommendations, the top recommendations that you would ask you as a tier one uh, right now are potentially evaluating relocating uh, workload from other countries, particularly a particularly Asia or some expensive countries in the U.S. Why should you consider Mexico and what is it that you're expecting from suppliers in order to gain business from that relocation? Well, you know what, first of all, as you, as, you, as you can see, I am fighting with the sunshine. I don't want to close my curtain because I am enjoying the beautiful sunshine in Querétaro. Anyway, as you know what, Javier, do you remember uh, Doroteo Arango? Do you, do you remember who is, who is him? Villa. Pancho Villa, we, 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 Pancho Villa. I will just remember a phrase he had, and he always used to say to the US citizens, for gold and glory, come south of the border and fight with me. So I will just say, repeat the same phrase for US suppliers, Canadian suppliers, and the best suppliers from Europe or Asia, for gold and glory on the aerospace industry, come to Mexico, do joint ventures and work with Mexican suppliers. As you can see in Europe, the, the, the excellence of manufacturing is not anymore in Europe, is on the Eastern Europe. And I will not exactly say Eastern Europe, it, it's in South Africa, Morocco and Tunisia are the manufacturing centers of excellence for Europe. And not only in terms of cost competitive uh, country, but in terms of quality as well. In Chihuahua, in Safran, the, the best uh, facilities worldwide are in Chihuahua. Just uh, I didn't mention before, but I work for aerospace, uh, Safran Aerospace which is based in Chihuahua. So the best uh, facilities worldwide are in Chihuahua. So it's not only cost, it's uh, quality, it's performance, it's metrics, it's uh, PPMs, it's OTD. I mean, those, all of those KPIs are coming from Mexico. I mean, the best KPIs from Safran are coming either from Mexico in America and Morocco and Tunisia in, in Europe and Africa. So Mexico is not only a cost competitive, it, it's everything, it's, it's, it's the delivery, it's PPMs, it's et cetera, and it's engineering, it's everything. There is a lot of talent, but I will suggest to those magnificent companies in, in the US, in Canada and in Europe, in other places, as I mentioned, come south of the border or come from just cross the Atlantic or the companies from Asia, just cross the Pacific and do joint ventures with those great companies like Hatsiri, like Eduardo, work in some kind of ventures and that will be magnificent. Uh, as, a, as, as an example, Safran is a company that doesn't need any, 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 what, how can I say? any partner because we have enough money. On 2019, we have an in, a gross income above 20, 20 billion euros on 2019. And uh, however, you know what? We have joint ventures everywhere, almost on every corner. Why is very simple? Because we recognize that we don't know everything. 
And there are many other companies that can give us the knowledge, can coach us and can help us develop any specific new product that we need in a specific application. So many times good joint ventures are the key to succeed. Obviously you need to look for a, for a good partner, a honorable partner. And there are many. It's just the fact that you have to find the appropriate one. And Safran has always found the appropriate ones that has helped us grow tremendously. So my message to Mexican suppliers and any other good supplier with good metrics, good KPIs is don't, don't think to go to the fight, to the war alone. Find, find, a, find a partner, find a, a colleague, find a good US company, find a, a, a nice Canadian, French, Singapore, China, Korean partner. Do the venture together, and that will simplify the the effort, and certainly will increase your your income. That will be my message, Javier. Thanks a lot, Alejandro. Uh, Hat City, do you have any final thoughts or recommendations before we close the panel? I will uh, just uh, want to thank Mexico Now and uh, all the colleagues that had shared this time with me. Thank you very much for sharing your ideas. It's very interesting and um, it's an honor to be with all of you and definitely to all the audience that it's uh, listening to us uh, definitely there is a huge opportunity in the aerospace uh, beyond a, a pandemic there is a growth there is a huge perspective there is innovation and there is a huge need of suppliers that could be ready thank you thanks a lot for city eduardo I think, uh, you know, just quickly, uh, uh, humbly, you know, I think uh, Bad Barrow Space is, is a success story about how we, we can bring to Mexico an investment that makes a difference for a country. So I, I think uh, if buyers, the base of the pyramid, we have elements of the supply chain missing in Mexico. That's definitely the truth. But if the buyers identify those needs and we can, attract the investments from the company that make can, can make the difference for Mexico, I think we can overcome some of the challenges that we have. But for that, we have to have the commitment from the buyers to concentrate business and also from Mexico perspective, not to fragment too much the business. Uh, it, it, is, it is attractive to have uh, our space everywhere, but reality is the amount of business is not necessarily there for different uh, facilities. But yes, we can bring the specific needs that are to complement the supply chain in Mexico and bring those key players that will really enable and facilitate the business for the whole supply chain. So we, we spend enough in Mexico that we can take the luxury to, to, to decide who to bring to the table. Great, great recommendations. Uh, Alejandro, I don't know if you have any uh, final thoughts before I close this panel. Yes, uh, sorry to be very insistent, but if I was a US supplier seeing this seminar and having the opportunity to listen to Siri or Eduardo, if I was Canadian or a US or French supplier, I will just hurry up and try to get in touch with them so that I can do a joint venture because I know Eduardo, he's a fantastic general director of his company and he does uh, beautiful products. I really appreciate what he does for the industry uh, out of Tijuana. Hatsiri, Hatsiri is the wonder woman of the machining in Querétaro. He machined huge pieces. I really appreciate her job. So if, if, I, I, if I was a US supplier, a French supplier, I will not hesitate. As I mentioned, <laughs> same as Pancho Villa says, for golf, listen, for golf and glory on this industry, you have to come uh, south of the border and do joint ventures. Uh, I mean, um, you can keep your sales, you can keep probably your engineering on other activities in your, in your home country, but definitely you have to send your manufacturing to Mexico and, 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 and sleep well. 
because your cost will be in control, your metrics, your KPIs will be in control with Eduardo, with Hat City. You know that you can uh, live in their shoulders all that difficulties of the manufacturing because they will certainly do very well. So it's, it's not that difficult. It's just the fact that you uh, decide and make that, that step to the front and, and work in those kind of joint ventures, Javier. I appreciate this, this fantastic seminar. I want to say thank you to you and Mexico now for this good chance to speak with such a great leaders like you, like Hatsiri and like Eduardo. Aviento, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Javier, appreciate it. Thank you so much for sharing your time and insights with us. Uh, for, for those of you in the audience on the supplier side that want to learn more about how to get close to buyers, get in touch with us. And for those of you who want to take advantage of the joint venture uh, processing that uh, Hunter's mentioning as well, there's a lot of operations that are going to be shutting down their business in the U.S. because of retirement. So we should have a conversation. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your time with us today. Thanks to the Mexico Now team. And we'll stay in touch. Have a great day. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.